So we're back, round one in Qatar, done and dusted. We've got a bit to talk about as usual after just the first round of the season. A lot of questions get answered and we start to see a little bit of a picture of what's happening in the championship. But did we really learn enough? Is what we saw representative of what we're going to see for the rest of the season? You can be forgiven for having some knee-jerk reactions after just one round of action. Here are my knee-jerk reactions to everything that happened in the first round of MotoGP. As always, guys, everything I talk about, every topic I have here, everything's going to be chaptered below. You can skip ahead to anything you want. We're going to start now in Moto3 with the kids. And of course, Moto3, again, this is barely a knee-jerk reaction because it happens every year. Moto3 is the king of international motorsport. Delivers every week, will continue to deliver every week. It is just the most exciting form of racing you could possibly come up with. I'm pretty sure we can all agree after one round, knee-jerk reaction or not, whatever, David Alonso is the best motorcycle rider in the world. He made a mistake on the penultimate lap there, I believe. He, he ended up back in sixth as they crossed the line. From there, I just remember thinking, if he wins this from here, no one's stopping him this season because you've got to have that knack. And some riders have it, some riders don't. You can be as quick as you want, but if you don't have that killer instinct in the last phase of the last lap of a Grand Prix, someone with it is going to beat you. And this kid has it. Olgado was good, controlled the whole race, pretty much rode exactly as he needed to, but didn't perhaps defend hard enough for that winning overtake from Alonso. Maybe thought he was going to have the pace to the line. I don't know. He did well, but... Killer Instinct wasn't there. But I do believe he will be in contention once again this season, like he was last season. If you can stop David Alonso, though, you deserve a, a medal because this kid's looking every bit world champion already. And we did say these were knee-jerk reactions, guys, so he could go on and not win another race this season. But, you know, is that really going to happen? I don't think so. Tayo Furusato, the surprise of the day, started about 18th, I want to say, and was just sensational. He was really mixing. He conceivably could have won the race had it all worked out a little bit different or if David Alonso wasn't such a freak on the last lap. Yeah, an absolute force, and we hope that that continues because we like seeing good young Japanese riders coming through. Good for him. If you can sort his qualifying out and show a bit of one lap pace. I mean, it doesn't really matter in Moto3. If you're in the lead group, just make sure you latch onto the lead group and then you can then do your work from there. And the race itself was, like I said, very good again. You know, we, we did see early on that group looked like a top six was going to get away. I think it was everyone from Olgado to maybe Kelso had opened up a little gap. I think it was from second place. We had the incident where Wader went down, took someone out with him. Can't remember who it was on the outside there. Ortola, who did brilliantly to come back to ninth, uh, finish in the end well inside the points, inside the top 10. So brilliant by him. Wader went down, took Ortola with him. And that sort of split Olgado from whoever was in, well, going into second at the time. And then it brought whoever was like sort of seventh back up to the back of Kelso. And then that train caught Olgado in the end. We ended up with a big relief group of about 11 guys. We lost guys coming into the end of the race. It was always going to happen. It looked like something had to give in there, and it did, with certain riders going down. But yeah, it was a brilliant last lap. Good positive results there for, I mean, you're looking at Ricardo Rossi via Suzuki. Okay, Kelso. Jacob Ralston on debut, 12th pl uh, 10th place. You know, obviously guys going down in front of him late in the race, but... Managed to pick himself up a top 10 on debut. Brilliant result. Uh, Pekeris, 12th on debut. Really good results there uh, for a few of those guys. I mean, mentioned Kelso there. If we did learn anything this week, Joel Kelso still cannot overtake. So I don't think he made one single on-track overtake for the whole race from what I was watching. <laughs> the poor guy. <laughs> he just kept... Every time he looked like he was settled in position, someone would go past him and he just gets... The, he does that thing where he just gets shuffled to the back of the group and ended up losing touch with them at the end. But yeah, great race again. I mean, not much more to say. David Alonso is probably going to be your world champion. On to Moto2. Now, this is the one class over the weekend that in no way played out in any way the way I foresaw it playing out. I mean, Alonso Lopez has this in his locker. He is quick. He can go and win races. But I think we were all expecting his teammate to be the one to do the business this weekend. And we'll get to that in just a second. But Alonso Lopez, Barry Baltas was brilliant. Garcia, fantastic to end up third. Ayagura did really well to end up fourth as well. Manu Gonzalez mixed it in there for a little while. Fell off the back in the end. Positive results. Joe Roberts, Vietti, Arena. Something to build on for those guys as well. Ramirez too. What? has happened here. I mean, it said it turned out least like I expected to. I probably have more questions than answers at this point. And the big wild card in all this is Pirelli. New tires. We had the same in Moto3. Didn't seem to have as big of an effect 
in terms of who was at the front. This has really thrown a cat amongst the pigeons here because some guys have taken to it and some guys are going to need to figure it out. And I mean, if we're talking knee-jerk reactions, I mean, it's like, well, season over for a few of these guys. They can't ride Pirelli's, done and dusted. They're going to be nowhere this season. In reality, I do expect them to figure it out. And I mean, the obvious candidates here are Fermin Aldeguer and Tony Arbolino. And you could probably throw a Philip Salach in there with that. Expected a bit more from him as well. So in reality, do you think these lads will figure this out? Yeah, I do. I think they probably went out there, got a bit of a shock with how it felt, what happened, which direction they were going through the field. You know, can it another one? Can it? Cannot once again this season. But these guys, I think they will figure out. I think they will have gone out there. I think it's one of those things that once you realize what's happening, you can maybe try and fix it in terms of the way you approach the race and the way you try and um, manage your tyres throughout the race. And we'll hope for their sake that they can figure it out. But it, it is something that I think quality riders in quality teams with good guidance will figure it out eventually. It might take them one or two races, but they'll get there. So I'm not panicking for these guys just yet. But I mean, if we are talking knee-jerk reactions, they're fucked. And we mentioned a few guys there that did get it right. I think there's something really to build on. For I mean, obviously, if you won the race or Lopez or your Baltus and you finish within a tenth of each other and you are the quickest guys on the day, you've obviously know what you're doing. It's up to everyone else to catch them now. Where it has brought riders into play that I, I did think would be there or thereabouts, but more in play now than I thought they might be. Sergio Garcia and Ayagura, the new MT Helmets team, really do look like they have something to build on because I think over a season long, if you're talking contenders, Alonso Lopez can be a bit on and off. So if it does switch off for him at any point, you got your Garcias and your Aguras do look like they probably are more consistent riders. And we've seen Ayagura do it in the past. And Garcia, I really like this kid. I really think he is going to be like this every week. Baltus, I don't know what to expect from him at the moment. Either A, he's really figured it out and he's going to be there all year, or this was maybe a one-off. And once other guys start to figure it out, he may end up down more towards where his teammate finished that race. Fender Gorberg in you know, 13th. Is Baltus going to be actually more around the bottom end of that top 10 into the sort of low points area? It's hard to say with him. I hope he keeps up because I really do like Big Bazza. He, he seems like a good lad and I really like his style on track. He's, he's, he certainly is exciting and entertaining when he's out there. And if I just have a quick look through the field because with the way it was working, you can probably look through the field and be like, oh, who did sort of do well on the tyres, but still didn't probably see it as a race result, but someone that you can look at and go, if they can sort it out early or qualify better, that progression they made through the field over over that race would actually position them really well in terms of a finish result. You're looking at Dennis Onchu made progress through the field. Celestino Vietti, another one, progress through the field throughout the day. And, and especially with those two, because they are in what is the best Moto2 team in KTM IO. You do think that with the guidance that they'll get from the team, as well as their ability, there is... They could be danger men. I mean, they didn't show in their hand this week, but you have to think they're going to be a factor later on. And the other one was Jeremy Alcoba, who made... I mean, he was sitting outside the top 20 at some point, came back to finish 12th. And you think that maybe if he'd started maybe a bit closer, you know, he's probably on for finishing inside the top 10 up with Vietti or Arenas or something like that, and, you know with the progress he made through the field. So the tyres worked for him later on, and a lot of guys that worked the opposite way. There's a lot of food for thought in Moto2. Moto2 is the one that I think is least likely going to be in this running order come the end of the season. The other classes, I think we're there or thereabouts on who's going to be around the front. Moto2, I don't think we are. I don't think we're near it yet. Let's see. Let's see what happens there. And of course, we move on to MotoGP now. And let's start with the sprint because, I mean, you talk about knee-jerk reactions after round one. How about knee-jerk reactions after sprint Saturday? Where for all, I mean, we had Martin win the race, Binder in second, which I think is just going to be him all season. But Aleish in third had all the pace, all the running, all the momentum coming into the, the end of the race. And if you think it's one of those ones, if it was a lap longer or two laps longer, he's a real chance to win the race. And of course, our knee-jerk reaction was, well, he's obviously going to win on Sunday. He's obviously going to win on Sunday. All he needs to do is that again, and he wins the race. But as we've seen in the past, it just doesn't work that way. One thing, and I actually think it's a negative aspect to the championship, but one thing that sprint races do add is like a second chance, a way to assess what happened on a Saturday and go, what do we need to do tomorrow? If we double the length of this race, where are we going to be? How do I need to approach it? What sort of lap times do I need to do to finish this race in the fastest possible time and adjust for what 
issues you may have had on Saturday or where someone was better than you on a Saturday. And I think that puts a distinct advantage to factory teams especially, and obviously mostly to the strongest factory team at the moment, which is the factory Ducati team, and their strongest rider, which is Peko Banyaya. And Peko will do this all year if he struggles on a Saturday or if it's not quite there for him on a Saturday or it looks like Martin's got him covered on a Saturday or Aleish or whoever or Binder even if anaya has got him covered on a Saturday no one turns it around for a Sunday like Pecco and he's going to do this all season and I think this is where you lose a bit with sprint races where you can set up a, the way it used to work is you'd set up on a Friday and whatever and you get to Saturday you qualify wherever you qualified fine whatever you'd get there on a Sunday and you needed to get it right the first time and if you didn't get it right the first time like Peko didn't this week you didn't have another chance to get it right and the teams with more resources are more likely to turn it around and get it right on the Saturday. It puts guys like Martin, I think, at a disadvantage. You might argue there where Aleish, again, Aleish had a disadvantage there because he had it right. First time out, he had it right. That was a full-length Grand Prix on Saturday, and that was all we did for the weekend. He probably goes past Binder and um, with the momentum, the way it was looking, he probably goes past Binder and Martin. And look, it may have changed into the last five laps of the race where maybe he used a bit too much tire or whatever, but the point is he had got it right for a first time time out against what everyone else was doing and so did Martin and then you get there on Sunday and other people have a chance to rework what they're doing Martin loses that advantage of being the best guy first time out there so does Aleish and now you've got Peko, who no one does it better than him, just going out there on a Sunday and going, we know what we did wrong yesterday. We know whether they had the advantage over us and we know where to make that ground up. And he played a perfect hand. He was fucking brilliant on Sunday. But, and yeah, look, let's talk about the Grand Prix because who who had positive weekends after we get to the end of Sunday? And, you know, we're talking about knee-jerk reactions again. You know, Mark Marquez. I mean, you got, there's going to be two schools of thought on this for, as a knee-jerk reaction. One of them is going to be, look, you can't, look, it's not that easy to mix it with the big boys. You couldn't keep up with, you know, Peko and Martin and Binder. There's another way of looking looking at it and that's that well he's had one race on that bike and he's finished what three and a half seconds off the lead if he gets to a circuit that he's actually good at or that he likes and he's had an extra few weeks to figure it out probably world champion as far as knee jerk reaction. so there's two knee jerk reactions you can have to mark positive weekend for him all around i think he'll be stoked with that not you know it's a it's a really good weekend for him and i think he'll build on that as we get to somewhere like portimao you know you th- you expect him to be stronger than he is in qatar yeah i think podium's on for him if not a win over the weekend don't know which race but it's on it is on i think pedro costa confirms that he is of course the second coming uh with a really strong weekend threatened a podium for a while there but then you know the long race got to him Ties just seem to go away from him. But that's a mistake you have to make for the first time to know not to make it again. So I think he'll obviously talk to his team now and they'll figure it out. Like, okay, where did it drop off? Why did it drop off? Did I go too hard at this stage? Maybe getting himself up into fourth position, if he maybe would have got a more positive result if he just sat maybe in behind Mark and just tried to follow him home. And then maybe he can launch something at the end. Who knows? But stuff that he'll figure out he had a really impressive weekend and in terms of like positive results for guys i mean i guess a positive weekend for alex marquez to be so close to the front and so close to his brother throughout the weekend so i'd take that as a positive result for him bastianini you can toss a coin is it positive to sort of like a fifth place on sunday and a fourth in the sprint i guess that's positive but when you're you're expected to win races and you finish two races there behind jorge martin who's after your job but it's something to build on anyway. You know, we don't want to be too knee jerky in our reactions where we're like, well, he's fucked. You know, he's never, he's just going to be fifth all year, fourth, fifth, might pick up a win. But, you know, you've got to lay a groundwork down and build from there. Maybe next week he comes out and he's strong. So you don't know. And really, in terms of positive results, that's all I've really got. I've got more guys with a bad, having a bad weekend than I do having a, certainly a good one other than the podium getters. And let's go through a list of guys like Jack, very poor weekend, couldn't keep pace in the sprint dropped out of the points after a good launch and then threw it down the road early on Sunday. And yeah. And you have to think with the issues Pedro had late in the race, even if he just managed to stay out there for a bit and with his experience and maybe having tires not drop off that bad, if he could have kept them in in good condition, he could have finished somewhere ahead of Pedro there and really just sort of calmed the situation down because obviously we are expecting now that you just, you know, Pedro's got his job, right? But yeah, just needed to do more well i mean it's round one we don't want to panic too much but we do have knee-jerk reactions early in the season and this is one of them this is one of the big ones for people i think where jack is just a spent force i like to think he's not maybe it's because i'm biased 
and I love the guy. In a similar vein, Maverick Vinales, just really nowhere, nothing weekend for him. Oh, what did he finish here? 10th. He might have been higher in the sprint. Ninth. Great. <sighs> he didn't finish that far off of Spargo in the end in the Grand Prix, but he's brained in the sprint. So, yeah, weird, just nowhere weekend. Didn't even notice he was out there kind of deal. Bez is another strange one. Was never really at the races this weekend uh, at all. Picked up a couple of points in the Grand Prix yesterday. What else can you say? You expect more from him, especially when Digi had a little bit more pace than that. Got a positive result. Actually, there's another one that got a positive result after a poor Saturday. But yeah, I'm not sure what's... He's just maybe struggling to get to grips with the 23 bike, uh, whereas though he took to the 22 bike like a duck to water. That's all I can think of. But he's finished behind three Japanese bikes from a guy who you're expecting to be probably a top five championship contender based on his previous season but the game has changed a bit this season with the amount of competition and things like that I, I personally wasn't expecting him to back up what he did last season I didn't expect him to be this low but I was thinking maybe yeah around where Digi is seventh or eighth or you know maybe somewhere around that but yeah this very poor very poor weekend Augusto Fernandez uh no points no points for Augusto. Whether you consider this a really poor weekend when a lot of people, including myself, probably just thought well, this is where he's at. But when your teammate's Pedro and doing good things and you want to keep your job, you might have to do a little bit more. So that will go down as a poor weekend for Augusto Fernandez just because he will actually need to do better. The other weird one was Luca Marini. Now, I want to have a chat about the All Japan Cup in a minute, but he's finished plum last in it and not even by a little bit. Jack Miller, who we mentioned earlier, went down earlier in the race and ended up catching Marini and going past him at one point. Marini got him on the last lap, I think it was, to end up not plum last to a guy who's already crashed in the race. But I don't know if this is right or not, but I'm looking at the times here and he's showing 42 seconds off the lead and 17 seconds off the back of Takanakagami which feels too much, feels like it's not right, what I'm reading here, but it must be, <laughs> it's on the official MotoGP website, he's finished 42 seconds off the lead, Taka was 25 seconds off the lead, bizarre, bizarre, now I have, the only thing I've heard, I haven't heard much yet, still early morning on the Monday here where I'm recording this, and I've had a quick scroll, and seen, the only comment I've seen from Marini is that he's just said he had a small problem, but it didn't mention anything about what the problem was, so nothing specific, and it wasn't a, he didn't say big problem, he said small problem, so could a small problem make you that much worse than Taka? It's worrying, it's a little worrying, I'd like to know what the problem is before I make judgment, but yeah, he's finished. And then the other one that I'm like, where were they this weekend was track house, after a positive off season, I thought, they struggled a little bit. I thought Raul Fernandez had pace to maybe do a little bit of something, but obviously had his issue on the grid, which just ended his race, started from the back, and still actually did well to get up as high as he was before he had to retire from the race. Miguel Oliveira, oh, he had a he had a long lap penalty, didn't he? And he's ended up getting a point. So not completely a disaster for them, but they'll I and they will have expected more. Um, I expected them to be at least sort of ahead of the Japanese bikes, which I think where the level that the Aprilia is at. Uh, so slightly disappointing, slight worry, but they did have their issues. So without those, would they have actually done what was expected? We'll see. The All Japan Cup won by Fabio Quattararo in 11th. I think you could probably treat that 11th, that 11, just take away the, the first digit and that's a first place for him. Zarco second, Mir third, and then Rins came 16th, so he's fourth. And then we go down to Taka and Marini all the way down the field. But Quattararo, winner of the Japanese Cup round one, 25 points in the bag for Fabio uh, in round one of the Japanese Cup. Uh, really good result. Zarco, impressive. Mir, nice to see him get some sort of a decent result, picking up points. I mean, he's well on track to beat his score from last year of 26 points. We're up and away. What's that? Three points for him. So if he keeps tracking at that level, he's going to smash his last year's target. Uh, Rins fell out of the points in the end uh, and by a fair bit. Finished a long way behind uh, Fabio. We are expecting with them, both the Japanese manufacturers, that with the amount of concessions that they'll be getting throughout the season, they have to have to be able to make up ground. So it's designed that way that they can develop throughout the season now and make up time somewhere. So onwards and upwards for the Jap the Japanese manufacturers. But the Japanese Cup, I think getting a top 10 for any of these Japanese uh, manufacturer riders is probably going to feel like getting a podium. But yeah, they need a little Park Ferme area for the Japanese bikes. You know, when you put like your top independent rider in there, they needed like a top Japanese rider in there. You know, a little spot for Fabio next to the f top three in Park Ferme. 
give him a bit of champagne and stuff. It'd be nice, wouldn't it? Uh, but that's it. That's that's our knee-jerk reactions to round one. And it's just great to be back. It's great to be back. Remember, if you enjoy the video, you've got to show your love down below. Not down, no, not, the button's down below. Not, okay. Subscribe, you know, and then that lets me know that you're enjoying them and I need to just keep making them. Uh, you understand how it works? It's free. It's a free button. You don't have to pay any money to press that button. If you want to follow me on anything else, the links are down below. Go have a look. Every race will be uploading a video like this. If you're new to the channel, this is what I do. This is my bread and butter, this post-race chat. They're not always this long though. Like This is going to be long because it was a lot. So round one's always a big one because there's a lot to talk about. But thanks for hanging in there. We'll see you on the next one. Goodbye.